problem with the death penalty. Okay, it's in, in the sense of of that's the penalty. Uh, but when they try to, you know, make it like a medical procedure, uh, like they're going into like an operation or something like that, I, you know, show it for what it is. You know, you're killing a guy, regardless of of the justification. We can all justify our actions in one form or another. The fact is, you're killing a guy. So show it for what it is. That's what it is. I think they should take it down to the Delta Center and, and show the public what, what exactly is going on. June 14th, a maximum security prison in Miami. This dramatic footage captured on surveillance tape and obtained by the Miami Herald. A shirtless inmate being chased jumps over a railing onto the floor below. That inmate is Kenneth Williams. The jump broke his ankle and vertebrae. Another inmate seems to come to his rescue after he falls, standing over him like a shield. Just moments before he takes the leap, you can see all of the cell doors at the Turner Gulford Knight Correctional Center open at the same time. Inmates walk out of their cells. It's not the first time there's been a security breach like this at the jail. There's a central system that corrections officers have to activate to release all cell doors, and it was also mysteriously pushed back in May. That time, there wasn't an incident. But this time, the Miami Herald reports corrections officers used pepper spray. They also found at least two homemade knives. The incident, and the question of who pushed that group release button, is under review. Sarah Gannon reporting. We should tell you, we reached out to Miami-Dade Corrections and Rehabilitation Department. This is, this is their statement. This is part of the statement. Quote, the incident is part of an ongoing criminal and internal investigation. The incident may not be commented on until the investigation ceases to be active and may not accurately relay the totality of events. Okay, so that's from the Corrections Department. Let me bring in David Ovalle. He's a reporter for the Miami Herald. He broke the story. He joins me uh, on the phone. And, and David, in reading your piece, I I know there was a similar incident back in May. What, what you describe is this group release button. That's when all the doors open, sort of mysteriously activated. It seems suspect. Tell me who has access to the button. Well, obviously the corrections officers have access to the button. Now they insisted uh, from the beginning that there was some sort of malfunction with the with the panel and that the lights went off on the panel. Um, what they did after that is they. Uh, the, the company that actually installed the security system sort of had like a second prompt, you know, sort of so you had to say, um, you know, you hit group release and then another prompt comes up and says, you know, are you sure you want to do this second, you know, this group release? Um, so that's why it was so mysterious. And the corrections, the corrections told me when I first wrote about this that uh, the, the, the company went through and ran a, a check and there was no malfunction according to the company. Um, that it was operator error was how they described Utah's it. Utah's death penalty law remains on the books after lawmakers turned back an effort to abolish capital punishment. But those same lawmakers might be surprised to learn the Utah Department of Corrections has already dismantled its death row. Now thanks to a KSL investigator uh, investigation and also the cold podcast team, we now know why. Dave Cauley explains. This guy has no conscience. He's a killer, a cold-blooded killer. In 1984, Walter Wood escaped from the Utah State Prison. This guy's bad. He's as bad as they come. we got to find him real quick. He'd spent time on death row, but his death sentence was overturned on appeal. That's when prison staff let Wood out of maximum security, setting the stage for escape. It appears there was no negligence, and no disciplinary action is going to be taken pending a full report. Police recaptured Wood after a manhunt, but it happened again. Gerald Brown escaped in 1990. Like Wood, he had been sent to death row, but won an appeal, which allowed him out of Max. Brown, shown here in 1978, is a convicted double murderer, serving a life sentence. Brown had used tools from the prison's plumbing shop to create a hidden compartment in a state utility truck. When an employee drove outside the gate, they made off with the vehicle. SWAT teams caught Brown near Sundance, but not before he tried to shoot a campground host with a stolen gun. These were dangerous and embarrassing lapses for the Utah Department of Corrections. They help explain why, for more than 30 years, this Supermax building has housed Utah's condemned. It's called Uinta 1, but in 2019, prison staff moved five of Utah's seven death row inmates out of it. KSL first made that discovery while working on season two of the Cold Podcast. 
It wasn't clear why, so last year we asked Corrections Director Brian Nielsen to explain. Right now there are seven incarcerated that are sentenced to death. He told us it was due to an old policy from 2005 called Last Chance. They have to earn their way to some place that that they have more opportunities. Like Nielsen said, moving to less restrictive housing. We've had a couple make it that far, but it's taken, you know, 13, 14 years to get there. We now know that last statement wasn't entirely accurate. Nielsen wouldn't show us the last chance policy after our interview. We fought to win this copy using Utah's open records law. Turns out last chance didn't say what Nielsen claimed. It didn't offer death row inmates a way out of Max. That change was much more recent. In 2018, the prison captain in charge of Uinta One sent this letter to the warden. He suggested eliminating death row altogether, and the prison did just that without revealing it publicly. We keep our guard up all the time while looking for opportunities to help people advance. Five of the seven men serving death sentences in Utah are today treated like most other inmates. They can move around more, work in prison shops, and are separated from society by fewer fences. And maybe that's no big deal. A New York-based prison reform group called the Vera Institute of Justice spent years working with Utah's prison bosses. Vera issued this report in 2020. It criticized the practice of housing death row inmates in Max, saying they are no more violent than anyone else. Right or wrong, Utah didn't need to act on Vera's report because it had already dismantled death row. Dave Colley, KSL 5 News. All right, thanks a lot, Dave. Well, the Department of Corrections tells us they're now focusing on housing inmates based on their behavior. In the wake of botched executions in other states and a shortage of drugs used for lethal injection, Utah has brought back the firing squad. Lethal injection has been by far the most common form of execution since the Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1976 after a four-year moratorium. Since that time, about 1,400 inmates have been put to death by lethal injection. That's 87% of all executions in the U.S. during that period. But a shortage of one of the most effective drugs has forced changes to the lethal injection protocol, leading to a number of botched executions in recent years. In response, states have begun seeking alternatives. Oklahoma is looking into methods of oxygen deprivation, while Tennessee is considering bringing back the electric chair. And now Utah's governor has just signed a law that will reinstate firing squads as an option for condemned inmates. Only three people in the U.S. have been killed by firing squads since 1976, and all were in Utah. Firing squads were banned there in 2004, but prisoners sentenced prior to then could still opt for the firing squad over lethal injection. The last man executed by firing squad was Ronnie Lee Gardner in 2010. Despite recent controversy, lethal injection remains the primary means of execution in the 32 states where capital punishment is legal. 16 states have secondary means of killing available, including the gallows and electric chair, though these alternative methods are rarely used. The last electrocution was done in Virginia in 2013, the last hanging was done in Delaware in 1996, and the last death in the gas chamber was carried out in Arizona in 1999. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back. Another episode of Green Lit Gang TV. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a gentleman by the name of Troy Kell, uh, born June 13th, 1968. He is currently on Utah's death row. One of seven inmates on Utah's death row was sentenced to f death by firing squad. Uh, Utah's way to kill their inmates is very interesting. Firing squad is only used in one or two states. Uh, it's not a popular... Um, way to execute people um it has been contested hotly contested in court um but troy kell is there for a reason and we will get into that he is convicted of two murders two of which were pretty infamous very famous murders um the second one of which made headlines all over the world in a way and actually brought hbo in to do a documentary about him and uh, the two murders he was convicted of, in particular the second one, which con which was convicted while he was already behind bars. So, kind of jump right into it, right? Troy Kell grows up in Las Vegas, Nevada, okay? Living a, for the most part, normal life, talks about it. Hey, raised in the neighborhood, goofing around, outside a lot, doing their thing, playing sports, but getting in and out of some trouble, mischief, you know, raising hell. Um, meets a girl by the name of Sandy Shaw, all right? She's about three years younger than he is, okay? They're pretty damn close. 
if you talk, and what I will say is you guys got to watch the documentary on him. It's called Gladiator Days, Anatomy of a Prison Murder. It's an HBO documentary. It came out in 2002. Very good. Very interesting. Uh, there's some clips of it here on YouTube. Um, but I recommend anybody to watch it. It is an amazing piece of uh, of like true crime in a way. If you're into this sort of a genre, it, it's right up your alley. So they were close from a young age, okay? Troy was kind of seen as her protector, all right? Had little moments together. Um, doesn't flat out say, you know, they were seriously involved or seriously dating, but they they had a history, they grew up together. Well, a gentleman by the name of James Cotton Kelly starts coming around, all right? Now, at this time, Sandy Shaw is 15 years old. Troy Kell is 18 years old. James Cotton Kelly is 21. I did put his picture up there for you guys to see. Everything I read about this and everything that people talk about, James Cotton Kelly to Sandy Shaw was nothing but a problem. Began harassing her. Now, remember, she's 15. He's 21. Began harassing her. Asking her to pose nude, asking her to make out, asking her to go out. And she had repeatedly rejected his advances. It got so bad that he was calling her house all hours of the night coming by. The ma- Her mom reached out to law enforcement and asked, you know, can you do something about this? And they stated no because at that time in 1986, there were no stalking laws in place. And you just kind of imagine like, God, if there was just something that had been done at that time, who knows? We wouldn't even be here right now. I wouldn't even be making this video. Um, so James Cotton Kelly will not leave Sandy Shaw alone. Sandy Shaw approaches Troy Kell, who's 18 at this time. Young gun, got a lot to prove, an aggressive guy, not afraid of nothing. All right. She gets a hold of him and says, hey, I, I need you to uh, I need you to do something for me. All right. And. Troy Kell does. Troy Kell is definitely uh, a protector and was not afraid to, you know, do whatever it took to, um, you know, what he deemed protect his friend. So, and there's a third gentleman, by the way, William Merritt, and we'll kind of get into him a little bit. They get James Cotton Kelly to hang out. All right. Now, there were some weird things I read about James Cotton Kelly. One of which was that his parents' family, maybe him included, had been involved in drug dealing. They had gone from Canada. Um, After this case, his parents were actually indicted uh, for drug trafficking. That's just an interesting little side note. Doesn't have anything to do with this case in particular, but that is something I just kind of wanted to put in there that I read that I found kind of digging through a lot of this stuff. So anyway, you've got Troy Kell, Sandy Shaw, William Merritt. James Cotton Kelly. They go out to the desert, hanging out, doing their thing. Well, turns bad real quick. What ends up happening is Troy Kell shoots James Cotton Kelly six times in the face, robs him of around $1,400. Okay. They leave the scene. They leave his body there. They're all all young at the time. So what do most young people do when something like that happens? There's no social media back then. There's no phones. But – They go tell everybody. They go tell friends, and that's what happened. Friends began getting told. One friend that got told obviously kind of did the the duh thing and and called law enforcement. That's how they initially all got picked up. They were called the show-and-tell murders, and that's what the press dubbed it because it came out, and this really hurt Sandy Shaw in her case, that came out that Sandy Shaw had taken friends out there from her high school um, and shown them the body. And she basically said, you know, parole hearing years later, it was a stupid thing to do. It was wrong of me, you know. But at the time, man, they they really cracked down hard on her. She was 15, sentenced as an adult, life in prison, no parole. William Merritt did 12 years for his crimes, his involvement. And I will say this, William Merritt got out after 12 years. Turns around a short while later and attempts to kill somebody with a hatchet, attacks somebody with a hatchet. He goes right back to prison. And Troy Kell is sentenced to life, no parole, uh, for the murder of James Cotton Kelly. Um, Before we go any further, I will say Sandy Shaw was 15 at the time, if you remember. She fought her case. Her case was definitely kind of stayed in the media throughout the years because of the severity of her punishment of a 15 at the time. Yes, she asked Troy Kell to attack James Cotton Kelly. We don't know for sure what was said. She says it wasn't to kill him, to hurt him, scare him. 
prosecution, t- you know, apparently didn't want to hear that. Um, but thank God she was given a second chance. Some juvenile laws changed. Um, she did 21 hard years of prison and was able to get out in uh, 2000. Let's see what it says here. Oh, 2008, December of 2008. So almost beginning of 2009, she was able to get parole. Um, like I said, William Merritt got out after 12 years, committed another heinous uh, violent act, went back to prison. Troy Kell, he's the perpetrator, main perpetrator of the crime. Life, no parole. So he's in Vegas. Now you wonder, why is Troy Kell, well, he does this in Vegas. How do you end up on Utah's death row? We'll get into that. Vegas, Utah, or Nevada, right? Utah, they're not that far apart. There's prison exchange programs, prisoner exchange programs all across the country, right? Certain states will swap prisoners for whatever reason, okay? Troy Kell goes in there and he talks about this in that documentary I want you guys to check out on HBO. How He talks about how when he went to prison, he made a decision. I'm going to go in as a man and I'm leaving as a man. Either I'm going to somehow get out on parole. Even though I got a life sentence, maybe I do 25 years, get parole, or I'm going to die in here as a man. But I'm not going out um, any other way. Let's just put it like that. I'm not going out any other way. He's not losing his manhood in one of many ways you can lose your manhood in prison. Um, He made that very clear. He kind of went the racial route and was labeled. Now, and some of you can leave your comments, please. I encourage comments to be left. He was labeled as a white supremacist. And I want to get my terminology right. I don't want to say skinhead. I don't want to say, you know, because I know there's certain label and I don't want to offend anyone or say the wrong thing. What I read and... People can say whatever they want, that he was labeled a white supremacist by, you know, by the Bureau of Prisons and by the prisons he was in. So um, he goes in immediately. Like I said, he, he's a young guy. He wants to make his mark, stand his ground, not back down. He begins getting in altercations. All right. Some racially motivated. I'm sure some just demanding and trying to keep his respect. That's how he ends up getting transferred to Utah to the Gunnison facility. All right. Which is a high security prison. Okay. Um, when he goes in there, all right, now a few years have passed in his early twenties, mid twenties, he's already got a rep. He's already starting to build, build name for himself. All right. Well, meets a gentleman by the name of Eric Daniels. Okay. Eric Daniels, um, takes a big part in this story and played a big part in that documentary. Eric Daniels was, was in there for like a financial crime, like a bad check or fraud or something. Very small crime. Okay, gets a couple of years, and, and you and you hear about this, okay, and this, they, this is one of the big knocks against our prison system today, is guys going in for small crimes, going in to do 24 months, 30 months, 18 months, they're with lifers, they're with guys with nothing to lose, and maybe, I don't want to say forced is the, is the right term, but in a way, forced, coerced, you're kind of brainwashed, you brought in a gang for protection, hey, we'll protect you, you just got to do A, B, and C, and all of a sudden, they're looking at a life sentence, because they book somebody, all right? And um, again, I'm not letting Eric Daniels off the hook. I'm just kind of explaining this guy was not in on anything too crazy. And he ends up having a major role in this second murder that Troy Kell was convicted of. Um, so a gentleman by the name of Lonnie Blackman, an African-American inmate um, who was in the Gunnison facility. Troy, kind of like in Las Vegas, had been having racial issues, right? Threats had been begun to get made between him and Lonnie Blackman and other African-American inmates, all right? Um, But it was all reaching a fever pitch. It was all reaching this breaking point where something was going to give. So uh, what I read, and I want to make sure I say this right, Troy Kell, Eric Daniels put in for a medical request. Now, I, I could be wrong on this. I also read that they put in a request for uh Lonnie as well for Lonnie Blackman they were trying to all get out at the same time all right they were trying to all be out of their cells at the same time there was another inmate at the bottom tier that was helping Kel and you see him in the actual prison attack video he kind of first grabs Blackman kind of pulls him towards kind of like a shower area through the, the cell um doesn't play as major of a role as Kel and Daniels but he's involved well they get out they get led down a tier as the guards there Kel is able to kind of back up. There's a makeshift key. He's able to get out of. He's able to get out of his cuffs, and from there it's on. All right, him and Daniels are able to get out of their cuffs. They attack Blackman. Um, reports were um, a homemade shank had been made um, and passed to Kel um, out of like a prison door, like a homemade shank out of rebarb or whatever was made, and um, 
Kel definitely used that. Um, Lonnie Blackman was stabbed on July 6th, 1994. Stabbed him 67 times. Eric Daniels, the gentleman that was just in there on financial crimes, fraud crimes, held Daniel held uh, Lonnie Blackman down, kind of on his legs. You can see in the videos, just laying on his legs as Kel's stabbing him. Uh, Blackman's calling out for help, begging him, you know, not to do this. Um, Troy Kell is yelling racial things. He's yelling at the guards. I got nothing to lose. Um, he stabbed, um, like I said, 67 times, nine times in the eye. He was trying to f- inflict the most amount of pain he possibly could. And um, it turns into like this gladiator scene because the camera's getting it. It's this big pod they're in. Everybody sees this. It becomes like a show. All right. And you see that. And I think Troy, in my opinion, Troy's aware of that. Eric is too, but Troy's aware of that. Troy is aware of what's going on around him. He looks around after all these minutes pass. And you see guards on the outside, but for, you know they don't go in right away. And Lonnie Blackman is left for, left for dead. Um, and you see I put some still shots up of after the attack. You see the, the aftermath. And just the way Troy's walking, blood on him. He's walking around strutting. He's kind of walking. He's peacocking a little bit. He's got his chest out. He's, he's the man. And, you know, you got to, in prison, that kind of attack raises his stature, raises his level of just, he's feared, he's respected, look what he just did, everybody saw it. And then you add the fact that now it made the news, and oh, by the way, now HBO is coming in to do a documentary about him. He he became a mini celebrity, became a celebrity in the prison system. So, the attack happens. All right. The state goes after him um, intensively. Okay. What's interesting is that the trial, the court, because of safety concerns, the trial, the case is tried inside of the prison facility. All right. He's end up being convicted, sentenced to death by firing squad. All right. Now, this is where it comes in a little bit with the firing squad thing, right? So. He's been on, he's on death row, and, and then Troy Kell, you can tell, he says in some of the one thing I post, he doesn't care about the death penalty. He's just saying that the firing squad is not humane. My opinion, man, none of this is humane. Um, I don't think we should be talking humane now after everything that just happened. Um, in my opinion, it's kind of a sad waste of life. Um, everybody involved, it's just sad. Um, just death and destruction, uh, whichever way you look. Um and it culminates with him staring down the barrel of a death sentence. So he's still on death row to this day. Initially, he hadn't filed any appeals. All right. He he decides to he becomes like in 2003, he comes within a month of being murdered, uh, being not mur- well, some would say murdered, he comes within a month of being executed. All right. So there he decides, OK. I'm going to file my appeal. Um, Files the appeal. And that's kind of what prisoners do in order to stave off execution. They'll use their appeals and maybe they use them strategically. You know, I don't know the exact process of that, but I do know appeals is a big way to keep you alive longer. And then when you run out and it's kind of just a ticking time bomb until that day comes, maybe a governor can give you a stay of execution. But, um, you know, Troy Kell is still alive. Um, there had been a civil case filed by him and four other inmates. So there's seven total on death row. Five of them, including Kel filed a thing of like a, like a wrongful, like an inhumane treatment. Like it's a wrongful way to kill us is by this firing squad. They ended up losing the civil case. He remains on death row. Um, he did end up marrying, uh, a girlfriend of his in 2010. Um, he's done a couple interviews, not a lot. There's a good one. I, I, I don't want to get the channel name right. It's blood on the razor wire. Talk to him. Has some really good information. That video's got almost 200,000 views. Uh, it's a great channel. I would encourage you guys to check that out. Um, but I kind of want to know what you guys think. Um, I want to hear what you think about Eric Daniels. I want to hear what you think about Sandy Shaw. And I want to hear what you think about Troy Kell. Um, I really appreciate you guys checking this video out. Like, comment, subscribe. Until next time, see you guys around.